Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. We have been starting like that over the last weeks. It's the normal Easter thing, but uh, we sometimes forget the importance of, the, of those words. Christ is risen. That means Satan and all of the powers under his authority no longer have that authority. Christ has broken their hold. And through faith, we have that joy of knowing that sin and the power of Satan no longer can hold us. And even death no longer will hold us. For Christ is risen and we will rise with him. And then that is what we rejoice. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. A couple of quick other announcements. First, please remember uh, that uh, your bulletins for the service today, uh, if you're going through our website, are in the right-hand column, and they're there by date. You just click on it, it'll pop up. Uh, I know in our house, uh, my wife often uses her phone for the bulletin so we can watch on the computer. So you might want to do the same thing. Uh, it's under the description if you go to Facebook or if you go to um, uh, Vimeo uh, where it has a description there will also be a link to the today's bulletin so please you can pause us and then grab that and come right back also uh, we thank all of you who are continuing to contribute to the congregation who are continuing to send in your offerings um, a lot of the bills we have still continue just because we're not meeting together uh, does not mean those things are not important. So we thank you for those who are doing so, and we invite you, if you have not been doing so, to begin and, and to help the mission and ministry of God's church here at St. John. Uh, we are ready now to meditate throughout the prelude.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most oh, merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ by his, his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God, the giver of all that is good, by your holy inspiration grant that we may think those things that are right, and by your merciful guiding accomplish them. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading is from Numbers chapter 21. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way, and the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, 
we have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole, and if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Epistles from 1 Timothy chapter 2. And St. Paul writes, First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, so that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. 
this is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 16th chapter. Jesus said, In that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive that your joy may be full. I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf. For the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me, and have believed that I have come from God. I came from the Father and have gone into the world, and now I am leaving the world and going to the Father. His disciples said, Ah, now you are speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. That is why we believe that you came from God. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming, indeed it has come, when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you, that you may have peace. In this world, you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. This is the Gospel of the Lord. We confess, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
In the name of Jesus, amen. One of the societal issues that I've encountered as a pastor is neglectful parents. Whether it's because of drug use or whatever, you run into these situations where parents simply do not take care of their kids. The problem was common enough up north that the public schools would send bags of food home each weekend with all the children to make sure the children ate over the weekend. And a couple of times I heard about situations where high school kids were basically homeless. But being a tight-knit, small town, here's what would happen. Someone would take in the stray. The neglected teenager would find shelter in a friend's home. Can you imagine that situation? Imagine you're a father, and one day your teenage son comes home from school, and he brings along a friend, and he says, Dad, can my friend live with us? And looking at your son's eyes and seeing his compassion, seeing the desperation in both of their eyes, what are you going to (laughs) say? Yeah, your friend can stay with us. And imagine you're in this situation. There's sort of an awkwardness to it. The boy isn't really your child, but instantly you're a father figure. And it's even more awkward for the boy. You see, as a son, he would have a standing before you. A son who has a good father finds security in that relationship. A son knows that no matter what, the father will never leave him nor forsake him. But the boy who's astray, who's been taken in from the streets, For him, this relationship seems tentative. It seems temporary. So imagine you're this father, and you notice that when the boy needs anything, he does not come directly to you. What does he do? He asks your son to talk to you for him. Your son becomes something like a mediator through whom all the messages are passed. But then imagine that without the boy knowing, you choose to adopt him. Enough's enough. This boy needs a father. And you decide that you are dedicated to him and that no matter what, you're going to make sure that he is loved. And in secret, you tell your son the plan. Well, pretty soon, the boy asks your son for a favor. Can you talk to your dad for me? And your son says, no. No, you talk to him. So the boy comes quivering to you. "Uh, uh, Sir, sir, I I asked your son if I could have something, and he told me that I should talk directly to you. And that's when you present him with his adoption papers. And you say, that's right. You can talk directly to me because I'm now your father and you are my son. That's what Jesus is saying in the text. First, he says, whatever you ask the father in my name, he'll give it. Ask and you'll receive. He's saying that we have a relationship with his father through him. Through his mediation, Jesus has brought us into the household of God. But it gets even better. Because then Jesus says, and I don't say that I'll ask the Father on your behalf. No, you ask him. For the Father himself loves you. (laughs) Do you hear what he's saying? It's not that Jesus is unwilling to pray for us. He does all the time. 
It's not that he stops being our mediator. But in addition to all that, something amazing has happened. He says, you can talk directly to my dad because he's your dad, because he loves you, because you've been adopted, because you are now also a son. We heard about this a couple weeks ago in 1 John 3. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God. And so we are. Likewise, St. Paul writes, you are all now sons of God through faith. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, you have put on Christ. Do you understand? You have been adopted. You have been washed clean of all sin and your former status. And you have been given a new status before God. You are now a son. And this is our encouragement to pray. When reflecting on the phrase, Our Father, Luther writes, with these words, God tenderly invites us to believe that he is our true father and that we are his true children, so that with all boldness and confidence, we may ask him as dear children ask their dear father. Not only this, but Jesus says to ask for anything. Sometimes people get this silly idea that God only wants to hear about the big things, the important things, the spiritual things. Hogwash. When my Gracie comes and sits on my lap, do I only want to hear if it's something big and important? I tell you the truth, she can talk about anything as long as I get to look back into her eyes. So then this is our encouragement to pray. The Father himself loves you. He loves you more than you can imagine. He loves you more than you have ever loved anyone. After all, he sent his son to die for you so that you might be his. He sent his beloved to the cross so that you could be adopted in the waters of holy baptism. So ask. Ask your Father for anything. And in Jesus' name, he will give it. Now, there are a few caveats here. First of all, to ask in his name doesn't mean that those are just magic words that you tag on to any request. It doesn't mean, Lord, give me a million dollars and a Ferrari in Jesus' name. No. When our Father gives us good things, it's not because we prayed in a certain way or with a certain amount of emotion or said the right words. Rather, he gives us every blessing simply because he loves us, only out of fatherly divine goodness and mercy without any merit or worthiness in me. So then, to ask in Jesus' name means to ask according to God's gracious character. Ask the one who is gracious and merciful, and I tell you the truth, you will receive grace and mercy. And here's the other thing. Because he's gracious and merciful, he sometimes says no. Perhaps he knows that the thing you're asking for is bad for you. Perhaps he knows that you're better off without the thing. Perhaps he knows that you need to lack something in order for your faith to flourish. And clearly, if we asked according to our sinful desires, it would be wrong for him to give us what we asked for. For he does not want greed or lust or pride or selfishness to get a foothold in our lives. 
So there are times when the good father will have to say no. But that's not really the point of our text. The point of this text is that you can ask for anything, whatever, because the Father loves you. I love my seven children, and my love doesn't even come close to his love. If I, even though I'm evil, know how to give good gifts to my children, how much more does he know just what to give us when he hears our voices ascend to him? So ask and it will be given. Ask knowing that he always will do what is gracious and merciful. Ask in his name. Now, to this point in the text, Jesus says he's been talking in figures of speech, just like I did with my analogy in the beginning about a father who takes in a stray child. Jesus says, up till now, I've said these things to you in figures of speech, but the hour is coming when I'll no longer speak to you in figures of speech. What is Jesus talking about when he says the hour is coming? Well, in the Gospel of John, Jesus' hour is a reference to his cross. In chapter 12, he says, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And when the Son is lifted up from the earth, he will draw all people to himself. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. So then, hear the words again. I have said these things to you in figures of speech, but the hour is coming when I will no longer speak in figures of speech. That is, he will speak to us plainly by his cross. You see, the cross is not a metaphor. The cross isn't like love. It's not similar to love. No, the cross is the epitome of love. So why can you pray? Why do you know that God will answer you? This. Because the Father loves you. Here, the Father declared his eternal love for you. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. So you need never to wonder whether he has time to listen to you. You need never to wonder whether he wants to listen to you, or whether something is maybe too small for him, or whether he cares. For he has spoken plainly, once and for all, by the cross. He loves you, and he will do anything for you according to his gracious will. There were no lengths that he was unwilling to go if it meant adopting you. Do you see what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God? Indeed, I could give you all the metaphors in the world, beautiful analogies, parables, figures of speech, but in the end, those all fall short. Why can you pray? This. This is why you know he hears your prayers. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. God's not beating around the bush. Here he speaks plainly. In many and various ways, God spoke to the people of old by the prophets. But now in these last days, he has spoken by his son. This is his final word on the matter. Jesus, Christ crucified for you. Therefore, please know, he 
earnestly desires to hear your voice this day. It's almost too good to be true. Truly, we should have no status before God, for we are all sinners, wretched, at one time enemies. But even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, God made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And God has seated us with Christ in the heavenly places so that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. In Christ, you are adopted. In Christ, you are loved. God has spoken plainly. So ask him for anything and everything just as a dear child would a dear father. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. We give you thanks, Heavenly Father, that we come to you in prayer boldly, for you have adopted us through the blood of Christ, our mediator, that we might be your children. We pray that we might ever be bold to come to you with our worries, our concerns, our fears, and our needs for your support as we walk through this life in faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the gift of fellowship and faith you have given to your people. We thank you for the faith shared here at St. John and pray that our faith may ever be strengthened by your word. We thank you for the faith shared with Christians throughout the world, and we pray especially for those who are persecuted, that they might have the strength to withstand in the time of their need the pressures of Satan and those around them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the sick and the ill, that you might grant health and healing as you see fit, especially for those with COVID-19. Grant that their doctors and those caring for them may have wisdom and understanding with such a strange illness and disease. Grant that our physicians, our doctors, our scientists, all those that are concerned with research might find a way to treat this virus, that you, our, your people may be protected from the evil of this age. Be with those who suffer from mental illness, that they might find a moments of peace in this world, in this life, and that they may eagerly in faith look forward to the day of perfect rest with you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for St. John, and for our mission and ministry of this congregation. Though we find ourselves in strange times, our mission and our ministry never changes, to make your Son, Jesus, known to our neighbors and throughout our world. We pray that you would give us steadfastness of faith, generosity of heart, open mouths, 
that we may speak forth your praise. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the leaders of our nation, for our president, for our governor, for all those in positions to, to make and enact laws and to, to interpret those laws, that they may be moved not by political purpose, but rather they might be served, moved to serve your children in this world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the leaders of our church body, for President Harrison of the Missouri Synod and President Meyer of the Michigan District, that they might faithfully execute their offices and seek to bring all along in the confession of the true faith in their churches and in their lives. For the leaders of this congregation, pastoral and lay alike, that they may seek always your will in all things, and so praise your name before all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And to lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless and preserve you. Amen.